Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're just we're just waiting to start. We've got people joining us every second, and um, uh, I will begin properly in uh, in just under a minute, if that's all right. Right. Um, that looks like it's stabilising. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. My name is Will. I work for Rethink Mental Illness, and this is one of our series of seminars, really looking at the, um, at the community mental health framework. Um, as an organisation, we've been incredibly excited by this um, development. Uh, we, since we did last year, report building communities that care, um, and, and recently out to STPs. Um, we've really begun to, to fully appreciate how transformative the community mental health framework can be uh, for people severely affected by uh, mental illness in our communities. So today, I'm really delighted that we're going to hear from a broad swathe of the, the team that's been doing the Somerset pilot. Um, uh, we uh, will be sort of having a kind of quite an open discussion really about the learnings along the way. We're going to start by looking at the model itself and then um, having a question and answer session with a, a broad uh, selection of the alliance that's done it. Um, I, I hope that we'll be able to be really sort of frank about what we've learned along the way. Uh, just very quickly, my um, before going into the first presentation, um, uh, it's been clear it that the vision and leadership of a wide group of organisations coming together around the needs of the individual um, has been absolutely inspiring. And I hope the other thing that will come out of today is realising that there's a lot of iteration in getting things right or moving towards getting things right, a lot of improvisation um, across those organisations as people learn to work together, voluntary sector with itself and then together with the NHS um, to take authority to try and do something new. So I'm going to hand over to Kate Williams from the Somerset CCG um, to kick off a presentation and a Q&A on, on how that's felt to be part of. So Kate, can I ask you to introduce yourself and then perhaps Becky and uh, Jane, as you come in, you can also introduce yourselves and, and your roles. Hi, Will. Oh, I'm finally sorry, I've just seen this new slide. Forgive me. Um, we will finish um, hard at 2 p.m. Over to you, Kate. Thanks, Will. And um, just to really say um, that we are really delighted to be here today to present on all of the work that we've been doing over the past year in relation to redesigning our community mental health services and working in a new way with the partnerships that we've been able to create. So just to introduce ourselves um, uh, of us that are on the call and be taking the presentation. So my name is Kate Williams. I'm the Associate Director for mental health, autism and learning disabilities at Somerset CCG and I am joined by my colleagues uh, Becky Wardle who is the head of community uh, South Region at Rethink Mental Illness and Jane Yandel who is the service director for mental health and learning disabilities at Somerset NHS Foundation Trust and we'll be hearing from uh, my two colleagues there shortly through the presentation. So if I could go to the next slide please and the next one. Oh, we've already done this. This is good. Can I go to the next one, please? Thank you. So this is just uh, to kind of take you through what we're going to be covering today. So the summary and the key principles of the work that we've been doing. What is our offer? Uh, the work that we've been doing between Somerset Foundation Trust and our Voluntary Sector Alliance Partnership. Um, what have we learnt uh, and what are we still learning and any tips to share with you all today um, and how we've engaged with our primary care networks and our localities and the new way of working within our primary care space and how best we've, we've kind of gone about that and any learning again from, from that approach. Next slide please. Thank you. So if uh, any colleagues who are joining today have heard us present on the Somerset model, we always like to start with uh, our mood cloud, our sound cloud. And this is from the work that we did right at the very start of being asked to bid for the community uh, trailblazer um, approach. It's really important to us that we maintain this and we look at this visual in respect to the model that we've now created, because it's critical to what we've done um, around co-production 
and these words were taken from a lot of co-production work that was undertaken with our recovery partners and our experts by experience right at the start of really trying to redesign and rethink our approach to the way that we provide community mental health services and there's a few key ones for us that you know are key throughout all of the model that we've created uh, the need for peer support uh, to help me be with me uh, feeling valued and, and to be looked after by a team who are uh, putting the person right at the heart of all of what we do and we know from the community framework model that was introduced in 2019 that the impetus is really there for us to take that fully and immerse ourselves in that ability of breaking down the barriers between primary and secondary care. Um, and we wanted also to ensure that we could provide early access to assessment and interventions within primary care. And that was certainly something that came through loud and clear from our co-production exercises. Each of the areas that bid for the trailblazer work were asked to consider three different options within their model of the work that we wanted to push forward, either with relation to eating disorders or personality disorder pathways or inpatient rehabilitation. So for the Somerset system, we felt it really important for us that we focused on eating disorder and personality disorder pathways of redesign. Um, we heard loud and clear the want to reduce the uh, perceived cliff edge between services and reduce the thresholds and eligibility criteria from our pathways of care and really recognising and uh, signalling its importance in the partnership that we could have with our voluntary sector colleagues around offering that widest scope of support to our individuals who are utilising our services. Next slide please. So for us in Somerset, um, at the time of bidding for the trailblazer work, we were also going through a significant change with our primary care colleagues and building on, on what all areas will recognise around our primary care net, uh, networks um, and how that was broken down across Somerset. So in Somerset, we have 13 PCNs and we've broken down our uh, area, our geography into four neighbourhoods and locality areas and that also fits with a lot of the other work that we're doing around community services and the wider clinical strategy of Fit for My Future. So we're trying to take and make sure that mental health is seen as critical as part of all of the work that we're doing in the way that we're shaping services. We know that each location in Somerset will have um, some specific and unique needs to that area and that's why we wanted to make sure that we were building it from a PCN population based approach upwards. Um, we have been really successful within Somerset and being able to uh, recruit to our, um, our complement of staffing um, across uh, both voluntary sector and also with Somerset Foundation Trust. We, need, we know that localities need to understand, link and fully integrate with the current provision within those areas um, to ensure that that person receives a real integrated um, care provision, working between primary care secondary mental health services um, and our more traditional kind of primary care GP services as well. We know that mental health support should be seamless and not separate from provision and again that came very much through our co-production work working with our um, experts by experience and recovery partners on wanting to make sure that there was that seamless feeling of care. Um, we know that we, we need to make sure that we continue the engagement with our colleagues in primary care, GPs, health and social care in implementing the new model and that work continues all the time. We continue to have those conversations and developments and we tweak and we change our model depending upon the outputs of those conversations and are responsive to those populations in those areas. Um, and I've said a couple of times and you know I can't get across more strongly the need for us to co-produce at every stage and every level of the model that we've built um, which is critical to its success and as I've said already we are flexible in our approach and very open to working with the needs of the population as they present and the needs of our other colleagues across the health and social care system and I think I'm now handing over to Becky. Thanks Kate, that's great. Um, so as Kate said before, I'm Becky Wardle, I'm Head of Community Services in the South at Rethink Mental Illness um, and Rethink Mental Illness are just one of a partnership of nine uh, voluntary sector organisations that form the Voluntary Sector Alliance in Somerset. Um, so I'm just going to take you through in a fairly um, kind of whistle-stop way the, the, the what we'd see as the building blocks of our locality model. Um, so what, what's really important, what's really crucial to the model is that it's a multidisciplinary uh, team and it's a multi-agency team. It's statutory sector and voluntary sector and it's a one team approach. 
So we, obviously we've got those Somerset Foundation Trust clinical teams as being a really key um, building block in the locality model. And also around that, we've got a range of one to one support, group support and activity support um, that's provided by voluntary sector partners. We've also got the wider determinants in there. So we recognise that it's crucial for um, individuals living with um, moderate to severe mental ill health that they uh, are able to access support around um, debt, um, unemployment, all of those sorts of things. So Citizens Advice are a really key partner providing that, that support and help. Capacity building is also really key. Um, we recognise that we need to build up the voluntary sector. Those micro organisations are really critical too, in order that uh, the communities within Somerset are able to be a part of a person's recovery and people are, are able to live well in that community. So we have a place based hub. Um, there are four uh, localities within Somerset and each of those localities has a multi agency team. Um, located in a place-based hub. Crisis provision, also really key. So we have a community front room model of community crisis provision um, that is uh, accessible out of um, normal kind of office hours in each of the different localities in Somerset. Also backed up by a 24-7 all-age helpline, which is voluntary sector-led with um, round-the-clock clinical support. Um, and also uh, that provides a routine to the wider offer of support that, that is part of Open Mental Health. Peer volunteers are really key. So Kate mentioned earlier um, in that word cloud, peer support has always come through really, really clearly and importantly as being uh, a hugely important factor um, that, that our experts by experience leaders have, have, have recognised needs to be there throughout. So peer volunteers um, being really, really crucial. And then experts by experience recognising, as Kate has said, that co-production all the way through um, it is absolutely critical to, to the model that we're that we're working towards. Um, so so again, kind of the delivery model for localities I've, I've already mentioned, multi-organisational team, absolutely critical that this is a one team approach with voluntary sector partners and Somerset Foundation Trust um, colleagues working together as one team rather than two separate silos. Um, focused around GPs, linking in with primary care networks and, and, and primary care, as we've said. Um, this idea of removal of thresholds is really, really important and providing flexible support that's able to step up and step down. We don't talk about discharges anymore. We talk about people going on to manage independently in, in the community, but people are able to come in and access that support again um, whenever that whenever that's needed. Multiple entry points again is, is a really, really key um, aspect. I've mentioned the 24 seven helpline, but actually within open mental health, people should be able to access um, the, the service that, that is on offer, whichever angle they come in from, and they should never be turned away and told that they've come to the wrong place. A really important um, enabler for that is the idea of a trusted assessment. So actually, if one of our partners uh, assesses that, uh, that somebody needs an extra level of support from, from somewhere else within open mental health, that's trusted and, and, and accepted. And if we get it wrong, then we, we talk about that and, and learn and, and, and move on and, de and develop. So Black Pair is on there. So Black Pair um, is the one shared digital plan, which again is a really key part of our, um, our model, which has come through from our co-production. What we've heard from people with lived experience is that it's not helpful for them to have multiple different plans care plans and recovery and well-being plans when they're working with various different people. That needs to be one plan that's owned by them and can be viewed by all partners. So that's a, a really key part of our of our model and our digital development. Dialogue references the patient reported outcome measure and care planning tool that, 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 we, that we're using. And again, that, that forms the basis of that shared digital plan. And warm transfers there just to, to reference that we don't talk about referrals. This is a real kind of shift in language for all partners. And we talk about people being warmly transferred from one part of the service to another based on that trusted assessment. Next slide, please. 
So I hope that's not too small for people to see. Apologies if it is. So I'm just going to very quickly take you through this visual representation of, of, of a client journey. Um, so starting off um, in the blue top left, so access via all doors. So again, this idea of all doors is something that's come through from our co-production with our Experts by Experience Leaders group. Um, so, so, so just again, referencing that, that idea that actually whichever part of the system or the ecosystem a person comes into, then, then, then they're in, they don't have to be bounced around from pillar to post. Once a person meets with a member of the locality team, now that could be a Somerset Foundation and Trust NHS colleague, or it could be a voluntary sector colleague, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They can come in and, and, and meet with anybody. They have a guided conversation, um, and, and, and at that point it's established whether or not a light intervention is appropriate. If so, then they may be warmly introduced to any part of the, what we're calling the mental health ecosystem, again, which is language that has come through our co-production. And it's the idea that all parts of a community are going to be important for a person's recovery. So it's important that we think about this as a whole. If actually a, a kind of a bit more support is required, then that trusted assessment takes place via Black Pair, which is that digital shared care plan, which I mentioned before. Um, and then as needed, they can be warmly introduced to other members of the uh, open mental health team, be that a citizen's advice caseworker or be that um, a member of the clinical team in line with their co-produced plan, which, which is the dialogue plan, which I mentioned before. And that ongoing work and support can wrap around the person um, and, and, and that, that digital tool is used to record the interactions, progress and goals um, and, and discussion in that multidisciplinary team can be can be um, stepped up as, as needed to inform the um, level of support that's required. And again, just a really key thing is that people are then not discharged. People may move on to managing independently, but people are able to access again at any time because we um, are moving away from the idea of inclusion or exclusion criteria. And next slide, and I think we're moving on to Jane. No. I'm just, I'm going to cover this one. I'm not sure whether Jane's been able to join us yet, really? so it's back to Kate. Um, so yes, a culture is critical in any service development and I think uh, there's, as Becky's just outlined, a huge amount of change has already happened within the way that we work and, and one team, as, as I say, Becky's, Becky's already discussed. I think it's that whole system approach, the NHS and voluntary sector elements of the, were combined, they're not separated and very much seen as and treated as equal partners in the delivery of the service. Um, we've, we've talked about the differences in language. I think it's been a really interesting learning journey about sharing between us all the various different languages that we use and the way that that can be constructed and then trying to come up with a dialogue that's equal in its approach and recognises that the differences that the language has and how we best work together to make sure that the language doesn't become a barrier. We use a similar uh, set of, of words to mean the same thing. We, we remove the thresholds and as Becky says, we have that uh, trusted assessment, which is light in its, its approach. Um, I think also it's important around culture, particularly um, within commissioning and the way that we've kind of had to take this through various different leadership routes um, to get this service up and running. It's about the change and the ability to take positive risk taking as well and that culture being accepted that this is part of the journey that we're on together, that we need to make sure that everybody is um, with us on, on what we're trying to do. And part of that is around changing that culture and approach to way that we would have normally commission services and certainly our, our innovative procurement approach is, is one example of how we've had to change and bring people on that journey to make sure that everyone is comfortable with it but we're taking positive risk steps to make the differences that we need um, for our patients and, and our, our public of Somerset. We also have the warm introductions in across and between the services um, and as I've said a number of times the importance um, and central importance of co-production in, in what we're doing and that we all share a sense of openness and transparency and always continuing our learning and that each partner is able to bring up and talk through any issues in an open and clear way that's respected and we move forward together. Next slide please.
So I just here wanted to talk through um, a, a slide that's been put together to really articulate the differences between previous ways of working and, and a new way and our, our new approach to that. So pre-transformation, we have a client here who has frequent GP attendances, um, increasing anxiety, unable to go out on their own, um, a long history of depression and hospital admissions, um, and recently prescribed um, antidepressant medication in the form of citalopram. Um, hasn't wanted to engage with structured talking therapy, um, no identified current risk um, and therefore hasn't met the criteria for traditional secondary care services um, and continues to attend their GP um, frequently. In the new world, in the new model um, for the same person, I'm booked in to see one of our liaison workers, our dialogue um, assessment was completed obviously with, with the individual to identify the needs and wants of that person and it's through that we've identified that that person wants to be less isolated um, and a non-medical prescriber reviews the medication and oversees a titration of the medication that's already been prescribed. Um, and one of our assistant psychologists um, provides some brief intervention on anxiety management um, interspersed with um, oh, B, I'm not actually sure what that acronym stands for. I'm sure I'll be able to come back to that when Jane's able to join us. If I attend anywhere um, and then in a, a person graded exposure. Um, methodology. Our VCSE recovery worker and wellbeing navigator meets with the client and supports them to attend the course within the recovery college that we've set up and the the person now only attends the GP surgery for an ongoing uh, complaint with their painful knee and actually by um, the person's own response feels that their mental health support has now been um, really well supported and is able now to feel less isolated and utilise the strategies and techniques that's been provided through that care process. So I think that really does highlight the great work of, of the change in the way that we've been able to provide um, the, the person now only attends the GP surgery. I'm sorry, I can see it, hear a little bit of uh, background noise there. So uh, on to this slide is about the learning and the learning that we've um, built as a system and taken as we go forward as well on our journey because we haven't finished. We will continue to learn and build as we go. Um, to engage our PCNs early and we're continuing to do that. I think also it's obviously kind of the, the timing, uh, trying to implement a new service during a global pandemic has had its own challenges, uh, which also has brought some positive steps as well of being able to just get on and undertake some of the work that we wanted to do and push forward our developments at pace to be able to respond to the COVID pressures and the surge that certainly we're all ex starting to experience. Um, our PCNs, of course, are under huge pressure. So that opportunity to engage with them and to understand from them the important points that they would like to see from a community model has been really critical. And we continue to engage with our clinical directors regularly about what, what, what's going on for them and how best we can support them within this model. To share our resources, training, learning and office space. Again, that comes back to some of the culture conversation and how do we create a sense of teams and a one team approach and being together is often a really, really good way of doing that. The fact that relationships and creating a new way of working needs time to build and to bed in and to build that sense of trust between different agencies. Um, to develop a vision early and to make sure that there are ways of working that support that. And again, that vision coming through from our co-production exercise to really bring together all the different agencies around having that clear vision, which is set right from that person and that person approach. Agree the common language. We've spoken briefly about this already, around the need for uh, acknowledging that we all use different terms, but actually the way that those terms can be heard can mean very different things for different organisations. So how are we going to talk and, and use language to enable those conversations to happen? Uh, to, to make sure that we've all got time to, to free up the space of being able to strategize and to allow that importance of the co-production work to happen. Information governance, um, I'm sure all colleagues on the call are aware of some of the challenges that can be brought around information governance uh, and obviously the, the the fact of trying to get some of those processes in place has been a challenge for the NHS and other organisations for years and so we're trying to unpick a lot of uh, historic issues around IG. Um, however it is integral to our model so we're continuing to make sure that we're having the right conversations and, and pushing forward. 
testing and learning, always willing to learn. It's critical for everybody involved and having that open conversation about when things might not have gone right, but making sure that we do that in an open and transparent way that we're supporting each other um, and resourcing it so that we actually are able to undertake the system transformation that we need to, to deliver, um, but that we've got the time and the headspace to be able to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So in conclusion, um, really, uh, I've already highlighted that COVID-19 has had to accelerate a lot of the work that we're doing, um, which has had obviously a great and significant impact on what we have been able to achieve. Um, continued ongoing co-production across um, Somerset systems and across with our recovery partners, experts by experience and other voluntary organisations. Um, further opportunities to build our model even further beyond what we were initially planning. Um, we are also in discussion around our evaluation um, and that's part of the national piece of work as well, which will be shared in due course um, and testing and learning for the national rollout. And of course, colleagues who have joined us will be involved in um, developing uh, your own um, community trailblazers for your own individual STP. So we're certainly supporting and helping wherever we can to share the learning that we've had from the Somerset system. And I think, Will, that is it from yeah, us. Yeah, thank you very much, Kate and Becky. Um, that's really, really useful. And what it actually means to work together as one team um, uh, about uh, COVID, about how data is handled. Uh, and most of all, actually, about impact. And you've certainly covered some of those um, in the last uh, few slides, but we'll come back for as many as much Q&A time as we can. And also any unanswered questions in the chat, we'll share with the speakers and send something around afterwards. But thank you very, very much. It's really, that gives us a really useful sense of the model that has emerged and will continue to um, be iterated. Um, we're going to turn now to a few, um, very short conversations with some of the wider stakeholders involved in this. So you're not just getting um, the HS and, and, and Rethink voice. Um, I'm going to start with Tim Baverstock, who's um, Director of Social, Head of Social Services at Somerset, um, and then move on if she's joined us to Angela Kerr from Citizens Advice, um, Julie Matthews from Watch Chard, which is one of the smaller charities, Chard Watch, which is one of the smaller charities in involved and absolutely crucial on peer working. And then Laura Perry, who's one of the um, many experts by experience who's, who's um, on this journey with us. And I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to turn first to Tim and ask all of the, um, uh, all of the, uh, the, the these presenters to, to, put on their, to put on their cameras. So when we turn to them, we can see them too. So Tim, um, can I just ask you to um, introduce yourself and and um, perhaps share with everyone any reflections you've had on how what's come together has come together over the last year and a half and any sort of key learnings from, from where you sit. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, so Tim Baverstock, yeah, I'm Deputy Director of Adult Social Care with responsibility for commissioning um, for everything uh, adult uh, in social care, um, but also work on um, Better Care Fund and integration within the county as well. Um, and my remit obviously includes mental health as well as learning disabilities um, and all other areas. So um, I, I guess on reflections, I'm really pleased to see some questions coming through in the chat as well around, you know, actually how, how was social care involved in this? How did you link to um, local democracy, localism, etc., and, and how did that play out? So, so I think my, my reflections would be that, you know, this is an NHS England project. This is NHS England funded um, as far as transformation goes, but Somerset um, with Becky, Kate from the CCG and other colleagues, um, our partnership trust, um, very much from day one felt that they wanted to include a local authority in this uh, and I guess my first reflection will would it would have been really easy just to say actually uh, mental health has been underinvested in in Somerset for a long long time let's just use this money to, to boost um, our, our staffing response our models to those people who um, who meet our threshold and who come into our services and it would have been really easy to do that in, in, in a you know in, in a normal way um, but actually you know as a group in Somerset we came together and felt actually no we need to do something different here we're not reaching the right people thresholds are not working across social care and across um, health uh, and we need to do it um, differently so I guess my reflection is that we were quite bold from the outset 
Um, and to be fair to NHS England, they really encouraged us to do that, particularly when they saw what, what track we were on. Um, so, so, so I would say we were bold and brave. Um, we had one real light bulb moment, which it might be worth me just really quickly sharing, which um, where we, we had uh, experts by experience and peers come into uh, one of our initial project um, meetings uh, and very quickly I literally saw and, and I can say this because I'm not part of the NHS um, I, I saw clinicians completely change their view in terms of actually what we were going to try and design uh, and how we were going to work with people uh, because they came into the room and they said you know I, I don't want a diagnosis I don't want a threshold I need to be supported locally close to home um, there's already people out there that can do this for me but I can't access them they're not part of your system um, so, so it was a real light bulb moment I think for um, a lot of what I would call kind of non-community elements. So, so yeah, I mean, those would be my initial reflections would just be if you're going down this path, be bold, be brave, don't look at traditional options, look at using the resource that is out there in spades in most communities, um, uh, because that's where people want those touch points. Brilliant, thank you. That's incredibly useful and it, it kind of shows the kind of um, the appetite to, to, to listen and do things differently underpinning transformation. Can I ask you, if you're looking for open mental health and, and open mental health, carry on listening, carry on changing, where do you where do you see it heading over the next couple of years? What's your ambition? I mean, I, I think my ambition, and if I can when I'm answering this, I'd like to touch on another one of the questions, which was around how we have commissioned this. Yep. Um, because again, even though it's not my funding, we've been fully involved as a local authority in the commissioning of this. and and. and the way that we've commissioned this is we haven't gone for um, traditional big lead providers. We haven't gone out to procurement based on cost and specifications. Um, we've co-designed this with people, but also with providers and with the voluntary sector. So we took a really early decision to walk into um, a room and say to all of our voluntary sector providers, we're going to walk out again in a minute, but we'd like you to start talking amongst each other because we do not want to award these contracts to one provider, um, large or small. Um, we want you to come as an alliance because there is such a wealth um, of experience and knowledge out there. So to answer your question, what I see is more people joining the Alliance, more local provision joining um, to, to help us with, with mental health. Um, and you'd expect this to come from me, but you know, I, I think we need more emphasis on the non-clinical interventions. Um, the only way we're gonna deal with um, demographic pressures and, and pressures in this space is to work on those earlier interventions. And also I think as Becky and Kate said, for, for people who um, come off any clinical interventions to continue to give them support as and when they need it um, to prevent them coming back on. So growth um, in that alliance, more and more organisations either joining up or being part of um, the picture um, so that people can access, but an absolute focus on continuing to provide that for the support as close to home as possible um, and in as non a traditional way as possible, because that's what people engage with. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. And I think, you know, uh, what you're saying would be true at any time, but particularly in COVID times when we're seeing um, such an incredible likely pressure on the system from unemployment and many other causes, that thing about it being in the end a total change um, in our response to mental illness and the need to keep the alliance going broader and wider is, 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 is um, absolutely essential. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to turn to Angela Kerr from Citizens Advice uh, and uh, the reason why it's so important I think to hear from Angela is that much of the support we know people want in their community will never be provided um, wholly by the NHS or even mental health charities. Um, much of what they say they need to support their recovery and well-being will be coming from uh, help on the wider determinants of, of, of well-being. So Angela can I ask you to introduce yourself and then perhaps give your reflections on um, how the last year and a half has felt and any key learnings you have. Thank you, Will. I hope you can hear me OK. I'm dialing in on the phone. Yes, clear as a bell. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. Um, our reflections on behalf of the advice sector is that we can see we are so much more effective 
when we're part of a wider team supporting a client because it enables each of us to bring our specialism into play um, in order to take the the client much further forward than we would otherwise be able to do working alone. My main reflections on the journey, and it seems like um, a long one, um, is that radical transformation isn't a wildfire phenomenon. And what I mean by that is we don't have to raise everything to the ground. What mm -hmm. I think has worked really well for us is building on what matters to our clients, listening to what our clients are telling us and taking forward the transformation that is easily recognisable to them. And I think these are points that Tim has raised and Becky has raised. Um, and certainly Actually, um, what I would recommend awesome. to commissioners is a relaxed commissioning approach, a tolerance for some uh, broad direction of travel without requiring the proposals to be too tightly specified. Thank you. And it's such a well-made point now when um, when STPs around the country are, are struggling with so much um, to think that April 2021 is going to be a big bang rather than the beginning of a long journey of, of focusing on um, what most needs transformation first and then iterating and improving, I think will be really, um, really good for people to hear. Um, can I just um, ask you, I mean, as you look forward, um, having been involved in this from the beginning, what are your kind of ambitions and hopes for, for this way of working in Somerset? My, our ambitions are that we have the opportunity to, to build further on this. Um, we've touched on some of the, the testing times, sharing, sharing our professional expertise and team, joining a team around the client. There's so much potential there, Will, for us to improve services and uh, create more rewarding roles for all of us. But it does take time and effort. And um, I hope that we stay on task and we maintain this momentum and we're supported to do that. Brilliant. Well, th thank you, Angela. Um, and I, I'm going to move now, if I, if I may, to... Um, to Julie Matthews. Um, Julie, can I ask you to introduce yourself and perhaps say sure. a, a little word about, about your organisation? Yes, sure. Thanks, Will. Um, so, so Watch is a peer-led project, a very small project that um, uh, uh, helps connect isolated adults uh, together. So we were uh, built uh, around lived experience. We've all had uh, mental health um, issues when we first started and uh, have gone on to um, develop our peer support and help other people support others th through that mutual understanding um, over the years. Um, Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and um, I, I, I mean, I'm not asking you to be an ambassador for all, right. all organisations, but right. do you have any kind of reflections on how it was coming together over the last year and a half into Alliance? It, yeah, it, it, it's it been a challenge because we were, as, as I said, a small little peer group that went on to become a community project. And uh, so we have very limited resources. We have a lot of uh, staff that are part time. So so the thought of coming into the to the alliance uh, was great because I myself over the years um, as a, a patient before um, I got into uh, peer support found there were a lot of barriers and got stuck and um, had my therapy and, and various different things but um, and got introduced to many many courses and ones and workshops etc but then got back to being stuck again and what i'm finding and i i'm really excited about with the um um uh, mental health uh, this network is that it's bringing everyone together in the localities there's this communication that's starting to open up you know to the wider ecosystem and it feels like now there's a journey for somebody uh, that if so if something doesn't fit and it's not working there's the other possibilities and that's what I'm finding even today I've had a phone call from somebody within one locality s saying they've got somebody that's not feeling um that um, some of the help that they've had is working and, and perhaps peer support is something that could work for them. So it's like 
breaking down the barriers and and and, and making that a freer place to, to to be in and and sharing those resources so um I, yes i think it's um excited but it's been a struggle for our organization coming on board <laughs> well, on that can i just say there's quite a lot of uh, questions in the comments about um particularly smaller organizations and coping with things like information governance and call to <laughs> yeah. most of it. How, how have you found that <laughs> Um, truthfully, a bit of a nightmare to start with because, um, you know, when a lot of us are not educated at working um, at a strategic level and uh, the language has been difficult to understand, the reading material has been difficult to understand. We don't have IT departments, we don't have um, uh, le uh, legal departments or something. So that's been hard. And so when when you get those anxieties, it, you are inclined to sort of like stiffen up and thinking, oh God, I don't know if I should be part of this. But I think um, not knowing and being comfortable, start being comfortable with not knowing and asking. And I now know that I can reach out and say, actually, I don't know. We don't know what to do here. Um, and, and we don't have a called guardian or a, a fully trained HR con a consultant. And can we can we have some more information? And, and the uh, Alliance and the Trust and everyone has been very supportive in, in, in saying, OK, well, we can help. We can help you with that and come back to us. And uh, so I'm settling down a little bit in, our, in, in the role a, a lot more. And I think if we can join up with other smaller little organisations within this and share um, like a call to got guardian and, and something so that we are acting at like one of those um, um, organisations, together as smaller smaller ones and that we can share some of those uh, difficulties and on that if i can just ask you a final quick reflection if you look ahead a few years where would you hope to get this work to well i i think i'm very passionate about all the other wonderful uh, uh projects um out there um in the ecosystem so that it becomes it grows bigger and it covers all those organizations so that that, that you know from somerset wildlife trust that are doing fantastic walks and um people doing photography so so it, it is so um has such a variety for people and i think bringing people more on board that's that that would be wonderful and and not be rigid in the way that we're working and competitive and 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 relax those um barriers i think would be wonderful thank you julian and that i think is a really important point because if after all the work of forming an alliance, it doesn't carry on going broader to meet people's needs, um, mm -hmm. uh, their whole needs in their community, and it doesn't keep on working out ways to work with smaller and micro organisations in different communities, um, then you've just stuck in time and you've only got I think, halfway along the process. Um, but I'm going to turn now to Laura. Um, uh, Laura, uh, you, you've been a key part of this for a while. I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself um, and explain your role both um, within the Alliance and, and within, um, within the Trust. Thanks, Will. Um, so yeah, I'm Laura. Um, I'm an expert by experience leader for Rethink um, and have been doing that job since March. And I'm also a peer support worker in um, the NHS Taunton Somerset Trust um, as of last December. So fairly new to kind of both um, roles. But I think what's really interesting is I kind of get both perspectives where I'm looking at this project as um, something that's that feels enormous, like transformation is the right word. It's a total overhaul of the system and everything that goes on, everything that I see sort of day to day in my job, speaking with clients and service users that, um, you know, feel that they have to tick certain boxes to access certain help. Um, and I also see the frustration of my colleagues as well, who, you know, try and do their best every day in this system that if we're all honest, it just doesn't work very well. It doesn't work because people feel let down and staff get burnt out and they've got compassion fatigue. And it's just, um, it's not really sustainable at this level, especially with the fact that mental health uh, issues are becoming more and more common. Um, so I've been really pleased to be involved with the project um, and I've been on all kinds of steering groups like right from choosing the name to I'm on the partnership board. Um, the partnership board, um, can we just explain its its role? Um, 
to everyone. Uh, you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> only, only if you want. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's strategic decision making. Like, uh, where all the um, kind of head honchos of the uh, alliance kind of meet together and talk about how they're going to move forward and um, we vote on decisions and we talk about the finances and things like that and um, how it all works but I think it's a really good strong group of people um, that will take us forward really really well um, and I guess I'm just really hopeful uh, having heard about the the project, you know, in March and how how huge the scale of it would be, and feeling almost skeptical at the beginning um, of how how that would change uh, the NHS as I know it to be, um, and how I used it, you know, as a service user myself, um, that it will lead to such massive changes. And I really like to imagine uh, open mental health as building kind of a, a net. Um, so all those gaps between those silos that we like to talk about where people are falling through. And, and that's that's your ambition uh, what, what, for the future to, to carry on seeing that growing. Do you, do you have a sense of how that might look? Sorry, I think I'm having issues. No, no, don't worry, can you I, hear me I can now? see my signal, yes. OK, um, yeah, so just imagine it as a net to kind of catch these people um, from falling through um, and it will make life better for everybody involved. Like we're not trying to give more work. We're trying to make this more efficient and, and better for everybody, better outcomes for everybody. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Laura, and thank you um, to everyone. I'm, I'm aware that um, we, we only have a short amount of time for questions. Um, but what we will do is write out afterwards with all the questions we've captured in the chat and put those around the speakers, as I mentioned. Um, I, I'm um, just going to go through, I'm going through the chat here and seeing that um, there are quite a few questions about how the commissioning happened and the balance of power um, in the Alliance, if, that, if that's a useful phrase, um, and how the Alliance worked with the NHS. So I'm going to bundle those three questions together, What, how the co-working between the NHS and the voluntary sector worked, how the commissioning was structured and how the um, alliance made decisions uh, was specifically to this point of equality and, and smaller organisations and ask um, Kate and Becky um, to, to respond to those and depending um, uh, on the time that takes we can look at a couple more questions before we we round off by hearing, hearing from Gail Bridgman from um, uh, NHS E&I. Thanks, Will. I think um, there's there's a number of um, points within what you've what you've just kind of said, and I've certainly been looking at the chat bar as well in terms of some of these questions. Um, I will also share um, with the Q and A's and the slides from today a, a document that we wrote around the innovation partnership approach to commissioning and, and procuring for this, which I would hope is really helpful for colleagues who've asked that question. Um, we chose an innovation approach to kind of do as as it says really in terms of innovate around the the provision that we wanted to get, um, and as Tim has already mentioned around bringing together. Uh, a, a, a wider variety of voluntary sector organisations acknowledging and recognising the breadth of experience that that brings. Um, so there's a whole kind of uh, paper that I will share around how we've done that, how we brought um, the system with us in doing that, because that is a fairly different approach to any of the commissioning we've undertaken before and the procurement routes that we've taken as a system. So we had to make sure that we were keeping all of our various boards updated. Um, and again, it kind of links back to some of the culture that I was talking about before and that willingness to positively um, take uh, good risks that mean that we get a different provision, that we mean that we keep challenging the system and doing things differently, which is right for um, our um, people. So um, there's a little bit there. And like I said, I'll add some further detail, just really aware of the time. I'll pop some extra information in the, the information that goes back out to um, colleagues. But Becky, I don't know whether you wanted to come in um, in terms of kind of relationships and how we've established that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, really conscious of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll speak quickly, but but we can kind of flesh that out a little bit more and circulate, as Kate said. So in terms of um, kind of decision making and, and relationships, I guess, kind of a, a, as the voluntary sector alliance, um, it is an equal partnership. So at the moment it's nine, um, nine charities 
And in terms of our decision making, we have our partnership board, which Laura mentioned, which Laura sits on alongside um, each of those nine organisations, each organisation having a vote um, about key decisions that need to be made, whether that's finance or whether that's down to the delivery model or, or whatever. We have our terms of reference. We're working on a partnership agreement, which is just kind of being being firmed up. Um, and we're also looking to grow and develop. So, so we we recognise that the, the governance arrangements that we have at the moment for a partnership of nine organisations probably will need to iterate and develop as we as we grow and move on. Um, conscious of time, do I'll, I'll wrap that up there, and we can kind of add more into to what goes out to partners in, in case we want to get through any more questions. Brilliant. Um, Thank you very much indeed, and we, we will, um, as promised, send more around after. I'm going to turn now to, to Gail, if, if I may, to introduce yourself. I believe you're joining us on, on the phone, um, so you, you'll still have um, uh, yet, more of, uh, yet more of me, but it'll be uh, Gail speaking. Gail, can I ask you to introduce yourself, your role, and, and just to give a few reflections on, on, on what you've heard? Yes, thank you, Will. Can I just check you can hear me OK? Because we've had a few technical well. problems. Brilliant. OK, um, so hello, I'm Gail Bridgman and I'm the head of clinical programme for mental health at the NHS uh, England and Improvement uh, Southwest Regional Team. Um, so we, we cover across the whole of the, the Southwest region and we work on a programme really of, of quality improvement um, relating to mental health services in the Southwest. Um, so our role is we, we, we sort of sit as a sort of broker between the national team and, and our regional teams. Um, and um, obviously we, we've been fortunate enough that we do have Somerset um, within our region as, as the early implementer and trailblazer site for the community mental health transformation. Um, I'd just like to um, sort of say how impressed I am really um, by the work. And I, I think this isn't just myself, but I think actually the the, the feedback that we've had from um, not, not just us, but in the national team and, and, and other parts of the country um, about how impressed we all are with the work that's happened in Somerset. I, I think the things that have really struck us as, um, about the work in Somerset that has been so encouraging is the way that it has been done in partnership. Um, and it feels like it has been a real partnership um, and not just a sort of um, I guess a token sort of effort and, and involving people, but it, it really is um, quite inspiring to see. Um, the other thing I think that's been really key, um, and I think Julie touched on it earlier, is about the um, the barriers, um, because we, we often hear about the barriers in services, um, the barriers in services, the barriers between different groups of staff, the barriers between different organisations. And I think that we've we've really seen that Somerset have worked incredibly hard on removing those barriers, um, but also the way that they've brought people along with them um, as part of uh, as part of the trans transformation work. Um, so our role and, and and part of the sort of um, reason that we've linked in around this this session today is that um, all of our other areas within the country are now um, being invited to submit models for their transformation work. Um, and um, obviously this, this is a huge piece of work and it's a huge undertaking and it's obviously been made a huge amount more difficult because of the impact of COVID. Um, so really we just sort of wanted to say that actually um, we, we appreciate the impact that that has had. Um, and um, it's something I think Will said it on a call earlier in this week, um, which I, I think I'm going to take and steal as a new buzz line. Um, but it's OK. Um, it's OK having a plan to have a plan, um, meaning that actually it, it's fine if you if you don't have a cast iron um, plan that is set in place about what your model is going to look like um, and, and what services are going to look like. I think we have to recognise that this is a huge, huge piece of transformation work and potentially it's a huge opportunity um, to really develop services. So I think we, we all need to sort of hold our hands up and say, actually, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it's a journey. We're going to go on it together and and it, things might change. And that's OK, because actually this is a big opportunity. This is the biggest single programme in mental health um, at the moment. Um, 
and we want to do it right. We don't just want to do it in the time scale scale that we've got available. We actually want this to be something that's really going to be important and matter to our patients. Um, I think the other things I would just pick up on from points that other people have made, raised as well is around do be brave, do be radical, be creative. Don't just look at what you have, um, but actually look at what you need. Um, and again, I take Angela's point about transformation isn't just about raising things to the ground, um, but actually you can build on what you already have, but actually is what you already have what you need. Um, so just think a bit more broadly and, and about what your services might look like. And, um, and it's OK if those change over time. Because I think as well, this, is, this isn't this is just a single year transformation programme. This is a three year programme of transformation. So, you know, don't don't be fixed on what you think the end point is going to be. But, um, you know, allow yourself the time and space to develop those models. So thank you. Thank you, Gail. That's absolutely great. And I think um, really reassuring to colleagues who must be thinking, how along with everything else do I have to deliver all of this by April? I think uh, we published an STP guide as Rethink Mental Illness um, a month ago. As I mentioned, it's on our site. And we'll put it up in the chat and send it around. But really, um, almost all that's in it is covered by what Gail has just said and also by that kind of light bulb, bulb moment that Tim talked about when um, people across different organisations are hearing from um, experts by experience, what are the main things that need to be worked on to be changed first? And then in changing that, the team forms that um, that does what needs to happen next. So um, thank you all for today. Uh, we at Rethink Mental Illness will be doing further webinars. We're doing one in December just after these um, plans have gone in for the first time on troubleshooting. We'll send around the details of that and further publications, um, all because we think that the community mental health framework is the most exciting thing to happen around SMI in our 50 years. Um, and we're all determined, as everyone else is on this call, to do our best to make it really land and become a, a lasting uh, benefit in our communities. So thank you again for all your time, uh, all of you on the call, and we will be sending around the questions with some answers. I can see that speakers are already adding answers. We'll send that round. And thank you very much.